This episode, Tamihana Kātene talks with Kati Maimoi Kaitahu me Waitaha descendant Isaac Teawa, a curator of Mātauranga Māori at Te Papa Museum, who is early in his journey with Taonga Pūoro. He talks on initiatives for invigorating the Taonga Pūoro community in Wellington and how preserving Taonga at the museum influences his growth and approach to mahi toi. Whakarongo maira. Atua tahi rā kamihia ke ki a koe, kei taku hoa. Nau piki mai, nau hara mai ki tēnei wānā ka kōrero o tātou. Ko te haumanu tēnei e mihia tuana ki a koe, o ko te haumanu hoki. No reira, e mihia tuana, e mihia tuana. A ka tima ta kātika ki te karakia, kia whakatūwhera ki te karakia, kia penei. A whakarongo rā tāne te tokorangi ki te whewa whewa o rau ka tauri, ki te wai o hine ki te oro ruarangi ki te kōkiri haimata. Whakarongo rā ki te hua ngongorū, ki te hua ngongorō, ki te ngū o toku ihu, haumie, hui e. Tāiki e. Uh, nō reira, tenei e mihi atua nō ki a koe. Uh, kei taku ringa rehe, kei taku hoa, e kaha hāpai nei i ngā afuatanga a kui mā koroma. Uh, tenei e mihi atua nā. A tenā whakamohia mai uh, ki te hunga whakarongo. Uh, ko wai koe. Uh, ko Isaac te awa toku ingoa. Te maika tapu ko hana nui, ko takitimi to waka e rere, ko moko tua toku awa, ko te roha toku marai, ko ngaitahu rawa ko kāti mamoi me waitaho oku iwi, ko kāti hui rapa toku hapu. Uh, ki te taho toku matua, ko auhau tiki o tērā toku maunga, ko tauai toku awa, ko matawhāroa toku waka, ko karanga hape te marai, uh, ngā puhi nui a tōni. Who am I? I am Isaac Te Awa. Uh, my current role is curator mātauranga Māori e Te Papa. Ko pai, tēnā koe. Nō reira, e mihi atu ana ki a koe, kei taku hoa. Yeah, no mai haramai, welcome to this kōrero. So, um, the, the purpose of the kōrero, we're, we're talking about um, practitioners in, in Tangupuro. What I really wanted to do and, and to, is to reach out to you specifically, because I know that you're early into, into your journey, mm-hmm. um, and I know that this part of your, your growth within Te Aupuro is only a, a minute section of, of the mahi that you do do in, in, in mahi toi. And so I, I'd really like to get some perspective from someone who works so closely in Te Papa Tonga Rewa mm-hmm. and how holding on to the, the tango of ma akui ma koroma influences the way in which you approach mahi toi in general. So yeah, kōrero mai, how, where, where are you at in, in terms of your, your tango puoro journey? Yeah, whakamohia mai. Okay, so in terms of tango puoro, I would term myself as just over the starting line of a lifelong race. Mm. Uh, so tango puoro is an art form that found me primarily in my mahi. So one of the things I'm privileged to have access to at Te Papa is Tango Poro and mm. the Tango Tuturu. Mm. They are uh, spectacular. Now, I come from a practitioner background. Uh, I learned raranga from my koro mm. as a child uh, and I've been learning more raranga as I go through my life. Yeah, I've learned whakairo from Rangi Kipa and that's something that I'm still learning through my life. But the one thing that learning to make or being a uh, kaitoi teaches you is that everything has a life force. Mm. We make taonga, they're born, and then that life force eventually dies. It goes mm. back to Papa Tuanuku. When we have things in a museum, we're interfering with that life force. We're mm. trying to keep them together forever. But the main one is that when you're birthing taonga into the world and rebirthing them based on old ones is to understand them, you need to be able to make them mm. to fully grasp the depth of that. And Tango Poro are extremely popular. People come in and they yeah. ask about them all the time. Mm. And I found I was in this position where I was talking about Tonga that I couldn't make 
Mm. I couldn't play. Mm, and I didn't know the kōrero behind them. And so the easiest way to fix that was to learn how to play myself. Oh, awesome. And that's what's brought me into this mahi. Yeah, awesome. And that's a really important aspect of looking after and talking about ngā mahi tūturu a te Māori, you know, traditional practices. Is it's really hard to explain the intricacies of something that if you, if you haven't lived it, or if you haven't studied it, or if you haven't brought it in as part of your life. And I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same, you know, I've, I've spent a long time uh, making wood chips and bone dust and stone chips, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, I have very little understanding of the intricacies of raranga, mm. which is which is something that I'd, I really like to, to move you know, move on to in, in my next part of the journey. So you you mentioned that it was more of a necessity for you to start understanding Te Aungapuro in, in your workplace. How do you think that draw, that pull towards Te Aupuro has kind of changed over you know, the, the more that you walk into Te Aupuro? How has that changed from as something that you needed to do to be able to do your mahi? And as how has that turned into something that you actually want to pursue because of some forming uh, bond with, with that kaupapa? So when we look at Poro and my mahi, they're... I mean, you have the physical taonga, but what wasn't made apparent was there's this general knowledge and it's hunger for people that want to know more about them, but there's this whole community that have dedicated their lives to those pōro as well. Mm. Uh, and I'm not from Pōniki, I'm not from Wellington, but there's a really strong pōro community here. So it's helped whakatau me into this whenua as well, because there are people everywhere that practice and live pōro, but they have this connection with their environment and those taonga. Uh, and that's just been a beautiful thing to be a part of. Mm. Yeah, so that's been like a really, really important aspect. But one of the things they did at Te Papa too was um, Poro integrated into different Kopapa Māori there. So we play them at Pohiri and Whakatau. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a member of our staff who opens his karakia with Nguru. Yeah, yeah. So me, I'm not a natural kaikōrero. Like you'll watch me bum everything up a, a thousand times. But yeah. Poro is another way of participating in those kaupapa, yeah. introducing your own voice. And when it comes to um, singing, like I sound like a bag full of rocks. <laughs> so <laughs> it's also given me a role and a job and a way to participate in tikanga and kaupapa Māori around the building as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just a really beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's really important too for that type of use and, and you know, we, we're starting to make sure that tanga pūro becomes like a normal practice within our tikanga. And I think that's just a really important thing to do. Because I do know at that Te Papa for, for quite a while there was Haumanuki Te Papa. Um, and uh, Papa Richard used to, to head in there and guide people through their journey. Um, and I know the, the, the Shanes, when they were in, in the full swing of things, and they used to love the way that they would integrate Taonga Puru into their aspects. Uh, one of the things that I am conscious about these days is that there's the, the quality uh, of Taonga Puru. Now, this is, this is something that could be a little bit controversial and, and when we, we start talking about it, the quality of how you play. One of the important things that I find in my journey is that it's important for us to display quality examples. Mm-hmm. And so when we when we use Tangapuro, uh, the Oroanga Atsua, in our cultural practices, that the people listening get they listen to really high quality examples of that. In it, Te Papa, how have you found the kind of weaning off of the activity of Homanuki Te Papa? How have you found that the playing journey of the of the of the, the staff and of the Fanu there who who carry this co Papa is it? Because I, I know they used to have um, one on every Friday or something. Um, is, is it still a, a common thing or is, is it a bit harder to get people together to, to kind of develop themselves and develop their skill sets? Uh, I think one of the things we need to be careful about with Poro is people tend to have a wānanga and then they think everything's done. Mm. Um, where it's, you know, it's like anything, it needs to be practiced and it needs to become a part of your life. Yeah, cool. Uh, so part of those older players at Te Papa, and I think there's only probably two left, which is Amber and Shane. Mm. So they play quality Poro examples, but then there are some of us newer ones who aren't up to their level. Um, mm. And it's really important that we get together and that we do practice. And we have been, but there's still only four of us. Mm. So uh, it's something we've been working quite hard on lately is to actually foster Poro in the new kaimahi at Te Papa as well. Uh, so we have a project in, in the works at the moment where uh, we decided that oh, Te Papa's a great place to educate the public. Mm-hmm. And we had all these taonga made for um, public programs and kids, you know. Where are they going to see Poro? But then we also realised that it's no good just having an educator talk about something that they can't play. Mm-hmm. So we need to actually make them players as well. 
Uh, so they need to start their own portal journey. So it's kind of you you have to foster the growth that you want to see. You can't just expect people to be heroes and have something authentic. So it, it is constant mahi through the generations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can't just have a one and think everything's done. Yeah. Um, so what Richard did, you know, 10 plus years ago, uh, that's that's a huge gap. You mm-hmm. can't just, you have to keep feeding into the people who are below them. Uh, and that's what generates a result. So that's what I've been a part of there too. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a hard road, but, you know, it's absolutely worth doing. So I find that, um, like, especially at Te Papa, and, and like, absolutely total your kōrero, um in terms of you can have the tāunga, you can understand some of the aspects of them. If you don't have a connection to them, mm. what's the point? So that's an important part of caring for our tāunga and developing our communities and our whānau in Te Apuro is developing the strong community of Puro. Just talk a little bit about your experiences in you mentioned earlier that Te Whanganui Yātara has a really strong Taonga Pūro community. I just want to talk to your experiences in that community and how having that type of developed community has influenced how your, your Pūro journey is going. Oh, it's um, really privileged to have access to such a great amount of players, but also recognising that all these players are very different in what they specialise in and mm-hmm. how they feel about Pūro too. Uh, so we have our public performers who like to be up on stage and tell stories. We have our people that don't want any of that, that they'd rather sit in the ngahere mm. and have, they have a different connection. Uh, we have the people who play beautifully carved pōro. Uh, we have the people that literally go find stones on the beach, and mm. that's where they explore their water. So they can be real simple or complex, but the people who learn and play pōro are the same. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of as you move through that, community, you see different layers and you gravitate towards different people mm. um, who teach you things as yeah, well. But it's really nice to see that Pūro is the thread that ties them all together mm. and you, like you do see them all in a room. Like Everyone does get in a room. You see it happen probably every month at least yeah. or they end up at the beach or in the ngahere or, and it's a really beautiful thing. And everyone sort of brings their own experience from their different urohi and things that they come from too. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's really important for us to call it all about is Tango Puro. When we say this term Tango Puro, sometimes people think of it as referring to this one thing, mm-hmm. you know, this this musical instrument thing that the Maori do, that we practice, that we love, that we follow. There's so much intricacy when you break it down to its parts. You know, there's like you were saying, the people that love being on stage. I am not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I prefer to be. Uh, in the Nahiri at night with one of my my hua and, and just just be. Mm. As you're on this this journey, and as you're as you're finding your way through this hikoi that is Te Arapuro, is there any particular aspect of this Kopapa Nui of Puro that that is resonating for you? you know, what what's calling to you? Is it is it is it a mashup of past skills and experience that you've gathered that you apply to it, or is it things that are new and exciting to you? Yeah, what, what is it? Where, where's your journey taking you? Oh, so I'm a curator. I work in a museum. So, you mm. know, I, I love my old dusty things and I'll <laughs> dig around in there for ages. Uh, but the thing that I love about Poro is probably its connection to the environment and the world around mm. it. Uh, so things like hue to me I find incredibly beautiful because they grow. Like mm. to even get one, you have to grow it. Yeah. Uh, and it has its own natural form. And when we look at how Pūro are adorned, like Hue or Putorino, uh, that's where my raranga skills come in. Mm. So it's it's kind of recognising that every aspect, um, every element that creates a Pūro is a specialty. So you need a gardener, you need a kairaranga, mm. you need a kava, you need somebody who has ngahere knowledge who can identify those rako and things in the bush to identify those shapes. Mm. And it's kind of like bringing all these specialties together that used to create these beautiful taonga tuturu that we see today. And we kind of are scraping to try sort of get back to what our tupuna would have considered basic. Mm. Um, but we're going through all sorts of crazy ways to do it where we expect to be the expert in just that one thing yeah. um, where they just had this diverse expertise across their whole whanau and hapu. Mm. And I think it's how we pull all those threads together. And I think that's what we're starting to see aspects of in Porto now with the diversity in the community. 
yeah. everyone has those specialties and it's seeing them combined. And I think it's being a practitioner too that helps you recognise that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just while you're, you're talking about it, you know, there are so many different aspects of making puoro, so many things you have to focus on, you know, from the rako side of things to joining them with, with anga if you're making putatara, pumwana, pupakapaka. Um, there's the binding is a completely mm. different game. I've been experimenting the last six months or so with binding with, with kareao and um, akakieke and stuff like that. And that is completely different again. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So it's these different aspects that really make this practice beautiful and, and for most of mahi toi. I think it's really important and you do some amazing mahi in it, Papa. And I know from personal experience that, um, you know, coming into the vaults and having a look at the time where that are locked away and protected. Um, I know from personal experience that that aspect of your mahi is invaluable for what I do because it gives me examples of, you know, of the masterworks of our tūpuna. I just wanted to have a quick, have a quarter or about how you, how your mahi in terms of looking after, caring for taonga tūturu and how looking after them also includes looking after the practice of creating them, which means access to examples and looking after our practitioners. How does how does this whole cope up of extending looking after just the physical tonga to the entirety of the kaupapa of our tonga? Mm. How does that work with you? So that's the meat on the bones of Māori and museums. Yeah. There's museums that were founded by Pākehā. They're mm. a Pākehā construct. So the taonga that are in museums were collected by Pākehā and their idea of looking after them and keeping them safe is usually to keep them in a cabinet away from people touching them so they last forever. Mm. Now, if you come from a Māori background, particularly a practitioner one, that is basically the opposite of how we look after our taonga. Mm. Um, we get to know them. We learn their intricacies. We maintain them when they break. We relash them when we have to. Builder. They don't last forever. Um, so it's kind of how do we take these taonga? Well, they've been left alone for so long. Yeah, um, so we've neglected them from a Te Ao Māori perspective. Mm. Um, and it's how do we reintroduce them now that there's been so much loss as well and that there's, these remnants are so precious. Uh, and for me, I do that through practitioners because they carry the modi of those art forms. If anybody's going to recognise the aspects of those tonga or what they were for or and rebirth their modi into other tonga is practitioners. Mm, kia and it's you have to you have to make the time and find ways to bring them out. But also uh, recognizing that those tonga can be damaged and they are special and we do want them to last for other people. So it's if we have to go in and engage you, make sure it's for a proper kaupapa and it's useful and mm. that those people are going to share and not gatekeep and take their knowledge away. And Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so it's um, those tonga really and their interests belong to us collectively as Māori and mm. I think that's a really important thing to navigate. There's been massive change in the last 10 years. So it used to be you could go in and you could look at them mm. and that was about it. And that's still the case for a lot of our tonga overseas. But uh, as more value is assigned to what? people can get out of Taonga and Taonga Tuturu in yeah. those collections. Um, they're opening up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one of the things I appreciate about your mahi is, you know, I've, I've, with the gloves on, yes, but I've still been able to hold them. Mm. And the, the, the ones that are, that are very old, beautifully, beautifully carved. And I think that's the, the main thing for me as a carver, looking at Putorino that was carved from you know, around the Cook period, the photos don't do them justice. No. You know, you, you, you hold them in your hands and, and the absolute masterful craftsmanship was just mind-blowing and you can't see that in the, in the, from you can't you search it on the website and have a look at the pictures you don't you, you don't feel that no and there's a lot you can tell just by being around and seeing the the depth or the weight mm. uh, just the, the angle something's carved from just yeah. those little intricacies hey yeah and like there's one goewe in particular that um, a friend of mine we were having a look at the bolts and there's, it's got a slight bend, a slight curve to it. It's one that Manetti Pairo was playing um, when she did a, an album a long time ago. And we were looking at it and we thought, like, oh, yeah, I wonder if it was made like that. Look through the bore on the inside, the idea. Um, and it was bored out just right. And it was like, how did they bore a curve? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, how did they even do this? And so, you no, know, another carver and myself and a couple of the curators, we just got right there and then and there, we started digging into what could have made this taonga look like this? Mm. And that type of wānanga is, you couldn't have that kaupapa without being there at that time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, without a couple of carvers who have got, you know, 15 years experience each in carving, a couple of curators, 10, 15 years each of looking after Tonga, and then throwing all these different whakaro in together to wānanga, why this looks like that. And I was like, you know, we came up with, I think the, the, the theory we thought about was maybe it was carved when it was green. Ah. And so as it dried, it naturally curved um, because the, the moisture and the tension in the wood, you know, and these types of interactions, I think, are absolutely key to developing and moving our practices forward. From a perspective of someone who works at the institution of Te Papa, moving forward, what does an ideal partnership, what does an ideal situation look like for you where the institution of Te Papa and the practitioners of our traditional art forms walk hand in hand, walk side by side, um, and move towards developing uh, these beautiful art forms that we have. What does that ideal situation look like for you? Oh, so for me, our ideal situation is, uh, I think, Maori and the people that those Tonga have special, like, that they're special to. Mm. Uh, the people who hold those Tonga um, paramount in their lives that still influence and are affected by them um, should really be in charge of judging how they're kept and what happens to them. Whether that's at home on Papakainga or in Iwi Whare Tonga, uh, where the repatriation needs to happen. Māori really needs a guide what happens to Māori taonga, mm. uh, especially in Aotearoa, because it's the one place that we have to grow those art forms as well. So they, it needs to be done in a way that works for us, uh, and it needs to be done in a proper wānanga context, okay? Mm. Nothing lasts forever. So what does that look like for us? They're hard conversations to have, but mm. where we keep those taonga, how they're cared for, both in Te Awairua and Te Ao Kiko Kiko, we need to talk about that and we need to decide that for ourselves. And I think that's really something that we're moving towards. And I think, you know, maybe it'll, hopefully it'll happen in my lifetime mm-hmm. and that I'll be able to be a part of that. But what I can do in that space now is lay the groundwork with our people by bringing them in, letting mm-hmm. them sure. know what tongue are there, uh, letting our practitioners explore and, you know, have those wānanga that you were talking about, figuring out how things were done. Because there will come a time too where those tonga may not be there forever. Mm, yeah, they're not in a stasis bubble. They're not going to last forever. <laughs> and so the more you can find out now, the more you can preserve that mātauranga for the future as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all about sharing it and bringing people in to have those conversations. So for me, I, w- I want to see Māori guide what happens with Māori tonga. Yeah, how does that look like in terms of what's required from the institution for people to guide this process. So will it mean training more of our uh, practitioners in the curating arts and you know, making sure that we can tick the boxes we need to to lead this process forward? Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely a part of it. So even curation is a Pākehā concept when we look at it. Mm-hmm. So it's the idea that you can go and read about something and know more than everybody about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in Te Ao Māori, we have to recognise that Expertise doesn't come from the university sector. It doesn't come from books most of the time. It comes from people who have dedicated their whole lives to a practice. Mm, So I remember having an intern who... I had to pick interns and I had an option between some university students and then a mother of um, five from Waifatu who's been weaving. Uh, And what she could tell me just by looking at patterns and picking something up oh yes, this is made out of kia kia and it's this pattern and they've started from the bottom and got, you can't teach that in a book. Mm. So for somebody who's never been a uni- like near a university in their life, where does the expertise really lie in mm. that area? Uh, and I think if you really look at it properly, you'll find it's with people. Yeah, kia ora. Te ao Māori is all about balance and I think that putting our practitioners in a space where they can flourish and enable our practices to flourish. Is, that's, that's the end goal, in my opinion, and I think it's a beautiful thing. It can be quite hard to access Tonga, and this is something I've experienced personally, and I thought we should talk about the stuff we need to talk about. Yeah. Because I know we've both been through these experiences and where we've tried to get access to things that we, through Papa, have a right to. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that can be very difficult. How do we approach this whole situation, in your opinion? How do we... Let's say, say, for example, if you were at Te Papa and they didn't have someone there who was so passionate about getting our practitioners in, how do you think we should navigate that space in terms of being practitioners searching for this mātauranga? Yeah, so that's the hard one. Um, and this is the importance of having Māori working in institutions, uh, mm. particularly Māori who are actively connected to their communities or who have practitioner skills because they can, you can't 
have those things and not see the value mm. in connecting them to people. We deal with it the way that most of our people have dealt with Pākehā institutions over the last 50 years. Uh, we write letters, we get our hapu support, we go and talk to everyone we can, we hōhā them on the phone, uh, and we make it known that it's no longer acceptable mm. to hold our taonga without talking to us to talk about them and to take them out of the context of what they are, and that is taonga. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we do what we as Māori have always been doing. Just keep going. We keep going and we make noise and we don't go quietly because at the end of the day, they are institutions and they're just as, you know, their taonga are just as important as education. They're just as important as housing. Um, so, you know, they deserve our attention cool. and our aroha too. And I think that's a, that's an, an important part for us to talk about is we practitioners – do it for the love of it. Mm. From my experiences with you personally and, and getting access to our taonga, it's me kore ake koe, my bro. The mahi that you do is fundamental in the development of practitioners within Poneke. So, tēnei mihia tōna ki ake e hoa. So, what's next on the list for you for Tonga Poro? What's on the horizons? What sparked your interest? Where, are you, where do you think you're going from here? Oh, so Tonga Poro, uh, they're just like the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. Uh, so, I remember, I think I was talking to you one time where you were talking about the binding representing the peace of Rongo between Tafiri Matia and Tane Mahuta. Hmm. Uh, and there's, I, re- I remember I was sitting down and I was with a, a raranga friend, and uh, Kia Kia is a real special plant mm. in the raranga oh, in no. the sense that. It can exist in the, the tops of a tree, mm. so it can touch tawhiri matea, exist in tānia, but run its roots down into tangaroa. Mm. So it exists in three realms at the same time. And then I just sort of had this enlightening thought <laughs> that, 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 that that's another reason why kia kia root is always used mm. on putatara to bind the two together. Mm. Um, so there's, there's clues and other art forms as to what those little breadcrumbs of puraka that we find in Tonga. So it makes me really wonder what else is out there. Well, absolutely. And that's the thing I love about puraka is that, you know, when you take them at face value, they're just stories. But when you start unpacking the matauranga that's in them, it's just your eyes open and so many different avenues spark up. So practically, how has binding with akakiake been going? Oh, it's it's an amazing material. So it's almost impossible to break. Mm. Uh, So when you split kiakia and then you wet it, it makes it sound like a guitar string when it's pulled taut. Mm. So it's a lot stronger than you would think, but it has this way of gripping. It doesn't come undone like muko or anything else either. So yeah, when you bind with it, it's really solid. Mm. I, but, have, I have heard in the past that it, if you if you bind it too tight and then it dries and tightens a bit more, it can crush oh, yep. things. That, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty amazing thing. The kekia is, is really special for me in recent times. I've been focusing on aka kekia and um, kareao trying to move away from binding with a natural fiber that I bought in a ten dollar roll from Bunnings. Uh, yeah. You know? And I, and just re- reconnecting the practice into the those areas of specialization we were talking about earlier where, you know, you need to understand where to go to look for kia kia. You uh-huh. need to know the environment that they're in and you need to be able to harvest it so that you don't damage the rako itself. And all of these different things. In your mahiraranga, um, in, your, in the binding that you do of Tango Puro, how important is it to refocus the binding of Tango Puro into your mahiraranga and then back into the taiao, into nature? Because um, that's one thing that's been quite overlooked in, mm. in Tango Puro. There are definitely practitioners that focus on it, but bringing the raranga flavor into Tango Puro is, is a really exciting thing for me. And so, Kōrero Mai, what's your approach when you're looking at binding, say, Putorino and like, Pukaya, that, those types of Tango Puro? And how does that raranga focus for you influence that? Uh, so for me, I'm um, I'm quite well known in the community as a binding snob. <laughs> so if I see binding I don't like, I, I, I will pick it up. <laughs> because it's also, it's a teaching method too, mm. is that the binding is part of the pōro. Mm. So if you want a beautiful pōro and you really want to do justice to the mahi, then that's a specialty and it adds to your taonga. Absolutely. So that's one aspect of it there. So it's visual and it's the skills of the kairaranga who can do that. They can they can help elevate your mahi. Uh, but the most important one is this connection to your whenua mm. um, and recognising that akakeke is rare and it's a lot rarer than it's ever been because we've cleared all our swamplands, cleared yeah, trees. Yeah, so, you know, um, and because of that, the kōrero that we were just talking about, about the importance of keke and what it represents has been lost 
um, because there are people don't have anywhere that they can go and see it every day. Mm. You want to find Akakirkia, you've got to beat feet in the Ngahere yeah. for like a good half a day before you see one sure. sometimes. So it really reflects our relationship with our whenua is reflected in our taonga. Uh, and also it's reflecting um, what we need to do to sort of get back to wellness in ourselves as well. Yeah, so that's a beautiful thing that it actually makes you more aware of your environment yeah. and the resources that you have on your doorstep. Kilda. But you also see the flavour from different rohi. So yeah. if you don't have keke, that's when you start to see, you know, that's when you start to see different styles of muka being used or different seaweeds and you know, every rohi has its own flavour. Mm. Yeah, and you see that with kokowai and earth pigments and things too when they're painted. They're all different colours. Yeah. So making taonga and poro, uh, it, yeah, it's all based on the environment and the whenua one way or another. Kia ora. You know, because in Kota Ate Māori, we now whakapapa goes right back to Rangi and Papa, so hmm. you know, we, we directly whakapapa back to our environment, and so it's important for us to carry that tikanga. One thing I wanted to talk to you about, just that you mentioned it, was the the kokowai. Oh yeah, and there's a there's a particular pigment that you guys have. Uh, <laughs> I think I've got a vial of it at home that I'm saving for a special occasion. What was that one again? Uh, puke poto. Puke poto. Puke yeah. poto, and it's a beautiful blue color. Yeah. Um, so, I think from memory there was Dante did a, a categorization of the um, different types of kokowai, and there are about fifty different shades or, or something like that. Mm. Is there a, a gravitation towards the ochre kokowai reds or have you seen the different pigments as well in the collections? Yeah, so red is, when we talk about kokowai, because Māori are obsessed, we love red. Mm. We love red. We love it so much that when we couldn't find it, we found lead paints to paint things with. We, <laughs> we love it so much that we ditched kokowai to start using sealing wax to get a more vibrant colour. Yeah, And that's like a tikanga that comes from a Pacific whakapapa. You know, red is the colour of kura. It's the colour of blood, so it's tapu to us. But there are different colours, and mm. they're more common than you would think. So as a kai uh back in the day, how would you get a black? You would bury it in the swamp. Mm. Yeah. That's a whenua pigment. Yeah. That's you adorning your taonga with your whenua. When we start to strip off colours of paint, we do find yellow, we do find browns, we find white. But I think the most important thing to recognise with kokowai is that while it's used as a paint, it's a paint that comes off of time and mm. weather. Uh, so part of our relationship with the whenua is to re-adorn our taonga with it. Mm. It's part of the maintenance and care of them. Yeah, kilda. And it's like the circle of modi for a taonga that weren't designed and created to be immortal. No. You know? and, and, and one of the things that I love about the, the practice of using kokowai is that it does fade over time. Mm. And so, that, you know, part of the process, you know, kia whakahaui i ngā taonga, kia whakahaui te maori, is to reapply, to check the bindings, and I think it's really interesting that you talk about trying to recognise that process in the curation of taonga at museums. Yeah. I think it's really, really important that we, that we think about that. In terms of educating practitioners, from a practitioner's point of view, I come into a museum, I look at a taonga and I pick them up and I may be a little less careful than most people would be because for me, they're not on a pedestal. Mm-hmm. In terms of because I make them and because I've studied them, because I've dropped so many of them that I've broken some lots of my own. How should we approach um, that whole process of being respectful of the process of looking after the taonga, but also not being scared to hold them in, in terms of where they are at Tapapa? Uh, so that's one of the beautiful things I see is people reconnecting with Tonga. So it's really important. Uh, one of the saddest things I find is when people walk into the Whare Tonga and they just burst into tears mm-hmm. because they've never been around their own Tonga. They've never held mere pounamu. Uh, people are disconnected from their heritage. Jura. So I don't want to deprive them of having that connection. But there's, you, you know, you have to talk to people and educate them too. Like People don't realise that these Tonga are so special that there's no replacement. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, you make sure that they don't have a big drop from the ground, that there is a table, that it is on some padding. Um, you talk to them. Sometimes even the oils from our hands can leave fingerprints and things that actually damage Tonga over time. Mm. You know, so you do things. It's, it's not a it's not a no. It's a, okay, so we might have to do some preparation, and, yeah. you know, put some padding down and some sponges and, you yeah. know, so you can sit down and be comfortable at a tipu and do that mahi. Oh, I think that's important too is that um, – when we do approach Tonga in the collections that 
We focus on the connection that we're trying to build with the taonga and the place that they are, but also they are, like you said, irreplaceable. You, you can't, if you, if you drop one of those those 200-year-old putorino in there, and there's no other ones to replace them. And so the thing for me is that we need to, as practitioners, be mindful of that, but also be able to touch and feel them. I think I've, I was a little bit of two minds when I had to wear the gloves um, yeah. when I was touching them sometimes. But, you know, when you stop and think about it, it makes sense. Yeah, so it's, it's not a no, but sometimes you just have to really think of ways to, to keep those time for other people too. But there are conversations as Māori that we sometimes need to have. Mm. And sometimes you do get people uh, with a whakapapa to a taonga. Like it's special to their whanau, so who am I to tell them that they need to wear gloves and not touch their taonga? Mm. Um, that's something I wouldn't accept if it was mine, so mm. why should I expect them to? Um, so it's finding ways where they can have that interaction as well. And there's something beautiful and people touching taonga too. I remember seeing a kid once pull these um, feathers on a kahu kiwi, which is, you know, yeah. Yeah, we all cringe, but oh. there is something intrinsically beautiful in seeing a tamariki have mm. that interaction with a taonga that's theirs. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's something we need to get back to as well. So it's finding ways to navigate between the two. Yeah, absolutely. So the place where we're at. So... Tangapuro, mahi toi, mahi raranga, mahi vakairo. It's in a space now where I think it's developing quite well and the communities are developing well. The relationships with the institutions are kind of getting better. And we, what, where do you think we go from here? What's, what's the next step in this journey? Okay, so for me, in an institution perspective, uh, we need to stop talking about our art forms in a sense of revival. Um, mm. Because I think we have done significant work in that period. So, Poro, it's been 30 years. Mm, are you still reviving the practice? I'm not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I think we can consider that still under construction, yeah. but looking at Poro in a social history context now, because mm. it has become part of Māori history. There are festivals happening. The demand for it's never been higher. We're starting to see it taught in schools. We're starting to use it. Well, we're starting to see it used in rongoa, hauora, mm. in our tikanga, our pohiri. So how do we capture and record those stories? Uh, where do we leave the breadcrumbs so nobody ever has to go through this level of revival um, when there's been such a huge loss of practice again? So, so that's from an institutional perspective. I think that's where we need to go. On a personal one, um, it's accessibility of portal recognising that it has a place in our communities, that people should be able to see it every day, that the first exposure shouldn't be when you go to a random pohiri and another rohi and someone's playing the putatara. Mm. Um, people should be born into that exposure and then have a way to find it and access it. Yeah, I completely agree. So the making experiences of our puro and our, all of our mahitoi, a normal thing is, you know, that's the goal, I think. Have you got any kōrero about navigating the space in the institution practitioner realm uh, in terms of any corridor that you want people to be wary of or to be not not, not necessarily wary but understand before they, they, they move into this journey um, you know there, there, there are always barriers there are always um, hard things to navigate um, there are also some places that have people that help like, like yourself at Te Papa how would you suggest that uh, people approach looking for the whakapapa through the taonga that are, that are, that are held at museums yeah, so I think when you're coming into a museum to see taonga, like, you know, when you want to see the stuff that's not on display, is being really clear about what your goals are. Uh, are we in this just for curiosity? Do you just want to have a nosy? Uh, if you're a practitioner, really try knuckle down what you want to learn and see out of this taonga. Uh, because if you can, if you can call it all to that, it makes us a lot less likely to say no. Mm. Uh, because there's more... You know, our taonga are precious and we, you know, we want to see more of them made. We want to see those skills grow. So it's finding out uh, what you really want to learn and how it will help you in your practice uh, and your people and your whakapapa. Mm. And then if there's people who have whakapapa to those taonga, ask them. Mm, ask them. You know, get your whānau and hapū and iwi support on your side as well yeah. um, because these are it's helpful to us. Just in terms of what you want to learn, like figuring out what you want to learn, being specific. I just want to quote you about that. Do you mean, like, if, if I'm a Tangapura practitioner, I am going into see you fellas at Te Papa, and I want to look at specifically the lower bindings of Putorino. Mm -hmm. I think that can be quite a, you know, that's a pretty specific thing to ask for. That's really specific. Yeah. Uh, sometimes as a practitioner, it's okay to, 
except I, I well, I've never seen a real one. So what I would like to do is find out what they used to look like. Mm. What shape are they? What are they made out of? Like those are really specific things too. Yeah. Um, getting into the the shape of the hole at the bottom of a kuwaiwo on the distal end. <laughs> oh, you know, that's yeah. that's really you now you're getting into really nitty gritty yeah. specialized. But accepting that everyone has their own different levels of matauranga yeah, too, and how we grow that. So. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes it is as simple as that you've never seen any real ones and yeah. you've been trying to recreate and make them. Yeah, and I think the, one of the biggest things for me when I first looked at the Puro collection at Te Papa was how big they were. Mm. You know, because you look at, them, look at them on your computer screen at the pictures, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, that's not too big. I go and pick them up by my hands and they're like almost <laughs> one and a half, two times as big as I thought they were, you know, and all the details are, are like – it's so much easier to make the waha of the central section of a putori nor that clean if it's that big. Mm-hmm. You know, they're those types of things. So yeah, I'd like, I'd really like to uh, mm-hmm. Thank you for all the work that you do. Oh. It's, it's, it's awesome. It, it, it enables us to do what we love and to focus on things that we love. So, any anything else that you have got in your mind before we wrap things up? Oh, no, I think that's me. Um, yeah. I'll be at Te Papa, so if anyone <laughs> needs me. Uh, but, he mihi kawana ki a koe e hoa, uh, moto mahi, ma moto haumanu. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to see you guys flourishing mm-hmm. and um, spreading the awareness and the matauranga and the education of Poro. Um, from lots of different perspectives, uh, lots of different mediums, and I think it's a it's a beautiful thing to see in our community, and it, it just makes this place a really beautiful place to live. Ah, koira, beautiful place to live. Let's finish up on that. Ano reira hemihia tuana kafaka kapi kati kaki te karakia unu hia unu hia unu hia kite uru tapu unu hia tane kia wate kia mama te nga kau te hina ngaro te wairu a te tina na ite ara taka tu te irongo faka iria ke kirunga kia wate kia wate haira kua wate o. Atu turu kia rongo kia whakamaua kia tīna. Tīna. Haumi e, hui e, taiki e. Mau di ora. Ko te piko te mahuri Ko ia te tipu a te rakaui Heri tātanga tātanga 